Hey, welcome to this edition of Build Your Tribe. My name is Shaleen Johnson, and today I will be your host. We are talking about, I'm sharing with you, the six things I had to do in order to be successful as an entrepreneur with ADHD, to be successful as somebody who is easily distracted, as I find many entrepreneurs are. We are the type of people oftentimes who see little details that maybe others don't. We pick up on patterns that other people completely miss, and this can be our greatest gift but it can also be our Achilles heel because you've got to be focused in order to be successful. So here are the six things I think made the biggest difference in terms of helping me to be successful as an entrepreneur. Thanks for joining me. The very first thing I had to do was focus on one thing, and that's probably the hardest thing I ever had to do. I grew up with a father who was an entrepreneur and did a lot of different things. I often saw him, you know, managing multiple business opportunities, different different ideas, different ways of making money. And so my belief was, you know, you, you've got to do all of these things and it'll all add up and that's what will make you successful. And, you know, for those of you who've heard my story, I did was doing all of the things. I was doing too many things at once. So I was working like 80 hours a week at all of these things. And none of them were really popping off. Like I was making enough money to justify each one of them, but not enough to feel successful in any one of them. I was working like, you know, 80 hours a week or or maybe not 80, but a lot. And I remember thinking what it must be like, what it must be like to just come home from work each day and not continue working. Like what must it be like to just work 40 hours and not have to work on the weekends. Like maybe I should go back and get a job because I can't rest. And then I had some very important advice from a mentor who basically said, you, you're not going to be successful the way you want to be, the way you have the potential to be, unless you learn to focus on one thing. And that's really, really hard when we are afraid that the one thing that we pick might be the wrong thing. The one thing that we pick might not be the the big thing. What if something else ends up popping off later? So, you know, it's it's this scarcity mindset that keeps us afraid to just focus on one thing. And we're like, oh, but it's hard to, I don't want to give up this thing because it's making a lot of money and it feels like you're walking away from money, right? And I just kept looking at very successful people and realizing what I don't have in common with them is they are known for one thing. They'd like focused on one thing and became very known for that. There's a great book. I think it's actually called Being Known. I'll figure it out and I'll put it in the show notes. But I remember listening to that book and thinking like, that, that, that's it. This is it. And the book came out like long after I followed that advice and decided to focus on just one thing. At the time, that one thing for me was fitness. It wasn't the thing I was most passionate about. It wasn't the thing I felt I was like meant to do. It was an opportunity. And I can see and sense from the market and the fact that there was this problem to solve that no one else had been solving, which was creating, you know, fitness programs and choreographing the music and the and, and not just choreographing to the music and giving the instructors the music and the choreography. I, I knew that there was a lot of instructors struggling with that problem and it was almost reaching like a boiling point. And if I didn't solve this problem or and market the solution, somebody else would. So that it was an opportunity, you know, and I seized that opportunity. But in order to do that, I had to put all these other ideas that I was playing with, all these other businesses, I had to put them aside. Now, here's what's interesting is I later went back to many of those things like, um, like for example, teaching business and marketing. That's what I do now, right? But at that time, it just wasn't working. I just didn't have the authority. I didn't have uh, the social media. Like it, it just, it just wasn't the right time. And so focusing on one thing would be my first and most important tip for anyone who struggles to stay focused. Uh, The second thing that I did was set a limit on the amount of learning. When you are easily distracted, whether you've been diagnosed with ADHD or not, this type of individual tends to obsess with learning new information. And I want you to learn and I'm still like obsessed with learning new things, but there's a point at which you have to stop stop learning and start implementing, where you have to tell yourself, okay, I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough to make it messy. And as I always say, 
in order to make money, you got to make it messy. Like you, ju- you just have to pull the trigger before you feel like you're ready. If you feel like you're, re- you're ready, you probably waited too long. And I, I had to recognize that there was, I was never going to know enough. And I, I just had to like realize, okay, time to pull the trigger and go for it. Even though I don't feel ready, even though I feel like there's more I need to learn, even though I, I feel like there's people who know so much more than me. And I had to force myself to implement. And I knew that implementation meant like taking action. So it was setting limits on the amount that I was learning and really just giving myself a deadline, like a date. Okay, on this date, no matter how far I've gotten or no matter how ill-prepared I feel, I'm fill in the blank, pulling the trigger. The number three thing that I had to do was less. I had to have more space on my calendar you know, when I was working full time for somebody else, and I, I look back at my day planner from back then, it was like every single minute of the day was scheduled to the max. There was no time to think or be creative. It was just like productivity, productivity, productivity. But I've discovered as someone who is creative and needs to focus, that in order for me to focus, I need more space on my calendar. So I know this is going to sound crazy, but like I do one major thing a day. I don't do five major things. Like I, I couldn't do multiple back-to-back podcast interviews. I just couldn't do that. that. My brain doesn't work that way. And so I think it's really important that we honor the way that our brain works. And my brain can't handle like back-to-back-to-back meetings, back-to-back assignments. I can't. And so that means maybe I have to do a lot less. And that's exactly what I did, is I added more dead space, more area on my calendar, more time available every single day to daydream, to to think, to process, to be creative. And you might ask, what does it specifically look like? This looks like when I schedule something, I might say podcast. And even though it only takes me, say, 30 minutes to record the podcast, I'll schedule an hour and a half. Because the truth is, it might only take me 30 minutes to record it, but I want like 30 minutes before it to really think through what it is I'm thinking and the points that I want to make. And that doesn't even include the research that I need to do for it, right? That's like another schedule. But then I also want to include the 30 minutes after I've finished to not just upload the files and come up with a, a great title, but to just think through like what would be the next thing somebody would want to hear, like to to give myself the space to to daydream a little bit, to, to get off course. Because if you're easily distracted, you can't change that about yourself. You know, you just have to set up the right parameters and you have to honor that about yourself. You have to, you have to see the benefits of it and how it can truly benefit your business if you give yourself the space and to allow and explain to people how your brain works because I'm telling you, like, there's so many people that I, I know they do not understand the way my brain works. They don't get it. You know, like we'll be in meetings, team meetings. And after I've done like, you know, maybe four different business centers, I'll have to be like, okay, I'm so sorry. We have to reschedule this. And thankfully, I'm the CEO. So I can do that. But there's a point at which I'm no longer useful. It's not benefiting anybody because my brain is gone. I've tapped out. I can't even focus anymore. And I think it's really important as you know, the owners, the CEO, the boss, then instead of trying to force yourself to have somebody else's brain, you know, whatever that is for you, that you set up parameters to honor the way your brain works. You make accommodations. You know, there's certain things like I can't force other people to accommodate me, but like I can find ways to accommodate myself, if that makes sense. All right. The, let's see, the fourth thing that I did was recognize that people can be a real distraction for me. So even though networking is so important, especially when you're growing your business, like you can only go so far on your own. It's so important to have the right people in your corner, to know the right people, to be introduced to the right people, to to be around those who've done the things that you want to do, people who want to pour into you. And I find that really successful fellow entrepreneurs love pouring into up and coming. Like we love teaching other people. We love being the know-it-alls, right? And we love like learning something and figuring out and then telling somebody else how to do it. 
So if you can get into circles where people love doing that, whether it's a mastermind or networking opportunity or going to the right in-person seminar, that is so powerful. Like I, so much of my success I credit with either mentors that I've paid or coaches that I've paid or just brief conversations that I've had going to, you know, events where there's going to be other entrepreneurs. Like I always tell people when they come to our event, Marketing Impact Academy, that, yeah, we're going to teach from the stage, but man, the 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 thing that's going to change like the course of your business is probably one unexpected conversation in the elevator down to the restaurant. Like you just, it's hard to get around those types of creative people when the energy is just surging and it's really important to do. But here's my tip. Schedule those in seasons. Schedule your networking in seasons, in small doses. So there's maybe you're going to pick like a six month period of time where you're going to do a lot of networking, but then you have to stop because we're easily distracted. You can get caught up in seeing what others are doing and thinking that that needs to be your next step. Or worse yet, believing that you're in competition with those people and then being hard on yourself and trying to launch new things when that's really what your next step should your next step shouldn't be that. Also, if you're always networking, if you're always trying to make these new connections, how do you deepen them? I mean, my most valued connections are those where I really feel like, like I would do anything for these people. Like I'm very, very loyal. Maybe that's just me. I mean, because I, I know lots of folks who everybody is their friend in, in the industry. That's great. I can't work that way. It doesn't work for me. It feels inauthentic. It feels phony. I don't like it. I don't trust it. It doesn't work for me. I find it very distracting. I would rather pick out people in the industry who I, I want to emulate the way they are living their life. I like their ethics. I like the way they treat people. I like the way they treat their family. I like the way they live their life. There are people who I've learned a lot from and they're incredibly successful in business, but I don't want their life. I don't want to live the way they're living their life. I don't want the relationship or lack thereof that they have with their kids. So it's like, it's knowing who do I want to network with? How do I want to, who, who do I want to network with? How do I want my life to look? And then how deep do I want to go with those relationships and, and setting some boundaries or seasons around the networking that you're doing. Otherwise, you're just constantly meeting new people and, and each person becomes you know, new introductions, new opportunities, and frankly, a new distraction. I have one girlfriend who, this works for her. She's constantly networking. Every single week, she's got like five new people that she wants to introduce me to. I love her. Natalie, I love you. But I, you know, she also knows, because I've communicated this to her, like, no, I, I can't. Like it, it really distracts me. And I love that you can do that and it works for you. And you've met all these incredible people and had them on your podcast. And they've, you know, some she has relationships with. But for me, it's, it doesn't help. Like it, it distracts me. And so it's setting parameters and boundaries around that. So, because you do need to network, but I think it also needs, there's a limit to it. My number five tip is to, Stop creating new things and instead focus on the things you've already done that work and make them work better. That was a really big one for me. When you are a creative, when you're easily distracted, every new thing feels like a new idea, a new business opportunity. Like, oh, we should be doing that. We should be doing this. And we should be launching that. And, and it, they feel like I'm going to make more money if I do this and do that. But it's so easy to overwhelm your team, to overwhelm yourself and to create, just keep creating because you've got these ideas and they're valid ideas, but you just keep creating mediocre things. Once I discovered that we would make more money and I would have more peace if I learned to, instead of launching a new thing, I just keep going back to the things that already work, that already are killing it and make them better make them better for the customer, make them better for our team, keep bringing on team members to improve the systems. Continually improving our systems is probably one of the most valuable pieces of advice I could give to anyone who feels a little overwhelmed and distracted because it's it's your systems. Improving those systems, it, it just kind of quiets your brain. Like you already know it. Like now make it better by looking at maybe, you know, 
industries that are parallel to yours or, or products that are parallel to yours, thinking about the ways you look at other products and, and saying, how can I incorporate that into this? And improving those systems is one of the best things you can do because you already have something that's proven. Just make it better. Like think about big businesses like the iPhone. The iPhone didn't also launch like, you know, a, a bunch of other sister products. I mean, eventually they did, but they're always improving the iPhone. Like it just keeps getting better and better. And then once you have a customer who's in love with something, they want, they continually want the better thing. Like they become lifers. And that is a really important tip. My last and final tip, which probably should have been my first, was hiring help. Hiring help, not just to do the things that you don't need to distract yourself with doing, but, and I haven't talked much about this, but I hired a full-time Shaleen manager, someone who helps me stay focused. Now, I don't know exactly what title to give her. I mean, some people might consider this like an executive assistant, um, but I have a full-time person who at the, at, at the moment, her name is Rachel, and Rachel's full-time job is to know what it is I'm working on that day and to help not just manage my time, but to manage anyone else who wants a piece of my time. So she, anyone who wants to schedule like a meeting with me, like they, ha she has, they have to go through her. So she figures out like, okay, what, what does Shalene need to focus on today? Is this, because I would say yes, right? Because I've got ADHD. So I'm like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Like I would say yes to everything. So she literally filters through all of those incoming emails and inquiries and meetings and scheduling. She knows how my brain works. She knows how much downtime I need. She knows how much prep work I need. She knows uh, how to prioritize things better than I do. And that's one of the you know cornerstones of having ADHD is everything feels equally important. Like you need to do all the things at all times. And I'm not great at that. So if I can pay somebody to do the thing that I am not good at, I could be more successful and I could feel better about who I am and how I am living my life. So she does that. And in addition to that, she also, you know, again, everyone who has ADHD, there's different types. I have inattentive ADHD, which also happens to, if you look at the brain scans of people who have this type of ADHD, we also really, really struggle to estimate the passage of time. So like right now, I couldn't tell you if I've been, you know, telling you, talking on this podcast for uh, 30 minutes or 15 minutes. I feel like it's been more than five. I, I really cannot estimate time. So therefore, it's difficult for me to manage my projects and to show up to places on time because I'll dig into a product project. I'll start recording a podcast and forget that I went too long and I've got a meeting in five minutes. You know what I mean? So her full-time job is to manage my schedule. She's, I, I get a constant ding. She'll say, 20, you've got 20 minutes left. You've got 10 minutes left. You, you need to be done in five minutes. And that might seem excessive, but she's paid full time to do just that, to keep me on task. So my recommendation to you is, and maybe that's not something you struggle with, but I'm sure that there's something that you do struggle with. And because of it, you lack focus. You feel disorganized or you find yourself procrastinating, falling behind, taking on too much, not doing enough. I don't know what it is, but when you realize investing in other people is the ultimate win. Like when you invest in other people, the return on that is exponential. Every At every single stage, when I thought to myself, oh, it's dumb for me to hire someone to do this. I can do this myself, no matter what it is. As soon as I bite the bullet, like having somebody else edit this video, having somebody else edit the podcast, those are all things I could do. They're all things, frankly, I want to do. I want to edit the video. I want to record the audio for this podcast and I want to edit it, but it doesn't make sense for me to do that when there's other people, thank you, Paul, thank you, Noy, other members of our team, thank you, Kristen, who do a better job at that so I can do the things that only I can do, which is show up and be me. So it is a an outdated misconception to think that you're saving time by doing something because you don't wanna pay someone else to do it. Trust me, you don't have to hire someone full time. My recommendation is to start, and we've done plenty of episodes about this. I will link to a few of them that we've done in the past, like how to make that first hire. But when you do, uh, it's just a part-time, temporary, you can hire someone just for one gig. 
And, you know, if that goes well, you can hire him for another gig. And then then you kind of start to build up the confidence and you've got the evidence that, wow, this, this actually did help me to focus. This did end up making me, me money in the long run. And if you spend the time, per, you know, really training that person and offering feedback, like what didn't, the, the, no one's ever going to do something the way you would do it ever. But if you, if you have the patience and you give them feedback and you're kind and you're patient and you're, you're good at explaining these things and you know this person has the potential in the long run by spending a little bit of time preparing them, training them and putting the systems in place, you will save yourself hundreds of hours and you're going to make yourself more money in the long run. And more importantly, you'll have peace of mind. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's the legacy I want to leave for people. You don't have to hustle your face off. You don't have to work harder, harder, harder. I mean, there's another way to make more money. It's called working smarter, getting focused. And I'm so happy that you spent this time with me because I know that's something you want to do or you wouldn't have tuned into this episode. By the way, if you're listening to this audio, I want to let you know, we also offer the podcast on YouTube. So you can find this on our YouTube channel as well. Click the link below and it'll take you directly to the the YouTube version. And if for some reason you want to see the way I styled my hair or my earrings today, this isn't even my hair. I'm wearing a hair extension ponytail. Isn't that fun? It made it much easier to get ready today. I didn't have to blow dry my hair. I just put it back in a ponytail and then I put this hair extension on it and I put these cute little rubber bands around it. And if you're listening to the audio alone, you're like, what is she talking about? I guess you better go check it out on YouTube. Hey, thanks for being here. My goal is to be brief, to be bright, to make it fun and then be done. We're done.